Hi all, I am Juliana Phelan and I am presenting on behalf of myself and Dr. Karen Harper. This presentation looks at patterns of vegetation structural diversity across heterogeneous landscapes in southwestern Nova Scotia. This presentation focuses on the preliminary results of my master's thesis for which my primary research goal is to assess and quantify these patterns of structural diversity across heterogeneous landscapes in southwestern Nova Scotia. So the figure you see on the slide depicts the orth mosaic from our drone imagery and it's just a good visual of our second study site. A little bit of background. So what is structural diversity and how does it fit into the overall umbrella of diversity? So it's a component of biological diversity and is similar to species diversity or species richness. However, instead of looking at individual species, it's grouping vegetation or species based on similarity in structural elements. So it's measuring the complexity of vegetation, and I'm doing this in a variety of different indices. So the first being stand structure, looking at tree diversity based on is it living or dead, dead trees being assigned a decay stage, as well as all trees being assigned a relative height. So the second is the diversity of structural groups. So this is looking at categories of vegetation structural groups, and that's the focus of this presentation. The third being spatial or overall diversity. As we are looking at heterogeneous landscapes, we also need to ask the question of what are forest edges? So forest edges can be defined as transitional boundaries between forest and non-forest ecosystems. So these play a huge role in the overall mosaic of the landscape and are crucial to its overall arrangement. So there are two different kinds of forest edges. So you can have a natural edge, which is something such as a forested wetland, which you can see visually below, highlighted in red. And the second kind being an anthropogenic edge. So this could be something like a harvested forest, which you can see highlighted once again in red, the clear cut below. So the goal of this study is to locate changes in structural diversity patterns in forested landscapes. So I have two primary objectives here. The first is to compare structural diversity at edges to other areas of the landscape. So I'm asking questions such as, are there distinct boundaries or are there gradual transitions across the landscape? Here we hypothesize that there will be higher structural diversity at edges as they contain vegetation from patches on either side of the edge. Uh, the second objective here is to compare patterns of vegetation structure and structural diversity in natural and harvested landscapes uh, by comparing the number of distinct boundaries in each area. We have two study sites. Both are located in southwestern Nova Scotia. The first is in Kejmakujik National Park near Big Dam Lake and the Hemlock Hardwoods Trail. The second is in the Medway Lakes Wilderness Area near Frog Lake. Both of these sites uh, are highlighted in red on the map, and you can also see them in the video on the slide. Just to give you an idea of where we're working. So our first site, or Transect 1, is in the natural landscape and is located in Kejmakujik National Park. It runs from Nixon Meadows Brook, the first quadrat is actually in the brook itself, through a young spruce dominated forest through to the old growth hemlock forest. Visually, we expect to see edges at the transition from the wetland, roughly here, as well as potentially between the two forest types, so where it actually transitions from uh, younger spruce dominated into a more mature hemlock forest. Transect 2 looks at the harvested landscape and is located in the Medway Lakes Wilderness area. 
It runs from the mature forest into the clear cut, then through a young spruce dominated forest across the road into another young forest, which then transitions into a more mature forest as you get closer to the bog, and then the transect concludes within the bog. So visually, we see edges on either side of the clear cut as well, again on the road, and then again as we enter the bog. So for our sampling design, it is the same for both transects. Each are 1,250 meters or 1.25 kilometers in length. Thus, they have 500 contiguous quadrats of 2.5 by 5 meters, which you can see in the figure on the slide here. So within each quadrat, we sampled for stand structure by identifying each tree to species, measuring dBH, assigning it relative height category, as well as living or dead. So all dead trees then had a decay stage. This is to help later to assign pseudospecies. Similarly, we also assigned a percent cover to 14 categories of vegetation structure, which are used as pseudospecies for analysis. We had 14 vegetation structural categories. These were trees, so anything with a dBH or diameter at breast height of above five centimeters. Anything that had a dBH of below five was considered a sapling. We had three categories for shrubs based on heights, so anything less than one meter, one to two meters in height, and then anything above two meters. We also had categories for ferns, herbs, graminoids, bryophytes, sphagnum, deadwood, stumps, ground lichen, and litter. Each of these were assigned a percent cover per quadrat. So that could be then used later for analysis as a pseudospecies. For this preliminary analysis, we want to compare structural diversity at edges to other areas of the landscape by determining if there are abrupt changes in structural diversity at edges or gradual transitions in the landscape to answer objective one. For objective two, we want to compare these patterns of vegetation structure and structural diversity in both natural and harvested landscapes. And to do this, we want to compare the number of distinct boundaries between the two landscape types. To quantify diversity, we used the Shannon Diversity Index or the Shannon Wiener Index, which is commonly used for quantifying species diversity or species richness in a particular area or community. However, we are not looking at individual species, we are using each structural category as a pseudospecies, assigning a value of diversity per quadrat. So once we have a value of diversity, we need to determine where the boundaries are on the landscape. So to do this, we used wavelet analysis, which is used to assess spatial pattern. Wavelet analysis consists of moving a template or wavelet that assesses the similarity between that template and the data at each position or point along the transect at several scales. The template itself represents the shape of the spatial structure. So for example, you can see uh, on the slide, we used the HAR wavelet, which assesses transitions, or you can use a Mexican hat template, which can detect patterns of patches. Um, so a high wavelet transform would indicate that the template matches the data and the spatial structure is then present. So we used the position variance to determine the location of the transitions. After running wavelet analysis using our structural diversity values, there were no significant boundaries detected in the natural landscape or on transect one. Here we defined a significant boundary 
as when the higher position variance exceeded the 95% confidence interval for at least two quadrats or positions in a row. So anything that was just one quadrat was not considered a significant boundary in this analysis. So visually, you can see what the transect looks like below the graph. So we expect to see edges or transitions when we exit the wetland and then again when we enter the old growth forest. However, none of these were considered significant boundaries in this analysis, thus are a more gradual transition occurring in the natural landscape. However, in the harvested landscape, we see multiple significant or distinct boundaries. So we can visually see these on either side of the clear cut as well as within the harvested area. And the fifth significant boundary is located near the road. So we likely see significant boundaries within the harvested area due to the regeneration of the stand. But what we don't see is a significant boundary when we enter the wetland using this analysis. So this is showing us that only in the harvested area and at the anthropogenic edges, we find significant boundaries and it would be a more gradual transition or change entering the natural areas or at the natural edges. The main take homes from this study are that there are abrupt changes at anthropogenic edges and in harvested areas on the landscape and more gradual changes at natural edges, which were not detected by this analysis. Perhaps a different shape of wavelet may show different results and be able to detect a more gradual change, uh, which is something to look at in the future, as well as our next steps are to look at the stand structure and tree structural diversity using pseudospecies, which are based on their relative height classes and decay stages, as well as living or dead, and as well to investigate patterns in canopy cover, basal area, and stand density, once again using wavelet analysis. We also wish to conduct another study with a similar analysis using 3D point clouds from drone imagery and LIDAR as another metric of structural diversity. So we have collected the drone imagery from both of our study sites and with the help of the technicians in the MP Spark Lab at St. Mary's University, we've processed um, using Pix4D Mapper all of those images to create our orthmosaics, which you've seen during this presentation, as well as the 3D point clouds themselves. So we would like to take a value or a number of points per quadrat and use that as a metric of structural diversity, once again using wavelet analysis to detect uh, significant boundaries or abrupt changes across the landscape for both of our sites. And finally, uh, we would like to say a huge, huge thank you to all of our research assistants, uh, Isabella, Yasin, Revent. Thank you guys so much for coming out with us this summer, as well as to our technicians from the MP Spark Lab at St. Mary's, uh, Greg and Wesley, for a lot of our logistics, as well as helping us with uh, data collection and processing. And thank you to everybody for listening to this presentation.